Merry Christmas, church. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here with you Christmas morning. Can you believe we're almost at the end of 2022? It's amazing. I hope you're able to spend some time celebrating Jesus today. I hope you're able to enjoy the day. Um, Today, I wanted to encourage you with an account of the wise men found in Matthew chapter 2. And if you have a Bible, feel free to open that. If you want, you can go grab it real quick. Um, this Christmas, I want to highlight the theme of faith. We've been celebrating Advent, and during this season, um, today we get to, to talk about faith. We talked about hope, we talked about love, we talked about joy, and today we get to talk about faith. If, if you can't remember, the last time you took a step of faith, um, it might be time to pray about what it means to step out of your comfort zone. Um, the birth of Jesus inspired great faith, right? In, in so many people, in Joseph and in Mary and, and people like Z Zachariah and Elizabeth and, uh, and, and others. And not to mention, though, the, the wise men. The wise men we see in Matthew 2. And one of the lessons that we learn here is people of faith, they take big steps of faith. So I want to show you how it unfolds in Matthew chapter 2. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So Jesus was born and still there's this star that's shining in the night sky in the Middle East and people from the East, Magi from the East, they see the star and they, they start heading toward it. And the reason verse one tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea is because there's also, a, at that time, there was, a Jesus, there was a Bethlehem in Galilee as well. So the prophecy in Micah 5 says that there's supposed to be a birth of the Messiah in, in, in Judea, uh, in Bethlehem of Judea. So that's why there's this distinction that's telling us that it's there. Bethlehem was and still is a holy site for many different religions, um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Uh, the name Bethlehem in, in Hebrew means house of bread, and the city was actually known for the birth of, the, of King David. King David, you might have heard the story of David and Goliath. He, King David was from Bethlehem. So even today, the city of, of Bethlehem is under Palestine, uh, Palestinian control, uh, under the authority of Israel. And yet, even amidst all this different turmoil that's happening today with Jews and, 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 and Muslims in the Middle East, you have several different Christians and people from all different kinds of faith traveling through to Bethlehem. So it's, it's become this amazing and significant uh, place for people of faith and people of faith take these big steps and these big gestures to get to Bethlehem. In fact, over 2 million people a year go through Bethlehem and, and because it was made significant because of Jesus. So it began that whole pilgrimage scenario. It began with wise men. After Jesus was born, wise men went to visit him and pay homage to him. And uh, these wise men, are, they're actually very hard to identify in the text. There's a couple of different ideas about who they are. Um, um, n the most known theory is that they were from Persia, Persia and they were uh, stargazers or astrologers uh, from the old text translations. And there's other translations and other new history that's coming out today by libraries that are being found underground deep beneath the floors of the, of the Middle East. However, the point is more that wise men were willing to travel far with all the supplies they needed, all of the servants they needed, the, the, the tents and they, the camels and the, the horses and everything. They traveled to get to Jesus because people of faith take big steps of faith. So the point I want you to remember is that the people of faith, they take big steps of faith and the wise men were not really followers of Jesus, yet they had these, these Jewish prophecy texts that caused them to find the, the star in the night and, and know that there was a prophecy about Bethlehem in Judea. This, it's an amazing thing to consider. People of faith, they take big steps of faith. So as you consider your own faith journey today, one of the questions I want you to ask yourself is, am I willing to take a big step of faith? And I have no idea how God's going to use this question in your life, but I know that if you follow him, if you seek God, if you're seeking to find and worship Jesus, God's going to use the question, am I willing to take big steps of faith? He's going to use that question in your life. It's a great question. And when we think of the wise men, we need to consider um, that their presence moving through Jerusalem was a big deal. 
it wasn't a small presence. It was, it was so big that it, it caused the attention of King Herod. So uh, our, 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 I, I hate to do this to you because I know that you probably have a nativity scene in your house that's beautiful. I'm sure it's beautiful. But the nativity scenes uh, that we typically buy from stores have three wise men and they have three gifts. And, and the reality is they probably weren't there. on. The, we know they weren't there on the, the day of Jesus' birth because Jesus had already grown up a little bit. Um, number one. Number two, um, we know that the wise men had more than just three people and three gifts and three horses. The wise men, the word is magoi and it's in the Greek and it's a plural word that means many. And so this is, it's really emphasized by the fact that King Herod knew that they were there. So they went to Jerusalem. There was enough of them to gain an audience with the king. That means there was probably a caravan of sorts. And they went to the palace and, and, and really if it was just three people, showing up on horses in, in, in the dead of night, no one would have rec- really raised an eyebrow, but there were so many people that several eyebrows were raised, so much so that it bothered King Herod, and we see that in verses 3 through 6. It says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So we have the promised king of Israel born, and the current king would totally be cool with that, right? Wrong! Herod was an egomaniac who had some of his wives killed and their kids killed, and he wasn't excited at all about a, a, the, a true king of Israel being born. Uh, Herod was known as an Edomite. His father was an Edomite, which really means Edomite. And if you go way back into your Bible history, you'd find the book of Genesis and learn about the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob becomes Israel. God changes his name to Israel. And Esau becomes the father of the nation of the Edomites. So there was negative history here in the past. However, at this point in time, um, Herod and his family had adopted the Jewish customs and so became Jewish. However, we, we, we know that he was not looking to honor God. Herod was kind of there to do Herod's thing, to be Herod the Great, to be the great king. And he wasn't really looking to worship or honor God. And we can contrast that against the seeking wise men from the east. Those men were looking for God. And Herod was nervous that they probably may have found him. An, a, a, a king of prophecy born in the land of prophecy. And what we learned from this is faithful people, faithful people like the, like the wise men, they are looking for God. So this Christmas, as you're opening all your presents, as you're thinking about what you have or your family or maybe what you don't have or the lack of family, if we really pull all of that stuff away, the question becomes, are we looking for God? Is He number one in our lives? And are are our eyes and our hearts pointed toward Him? This is one of the reasons I love the story of the Magi so much. We have we really have no real understanding as per how they knew about the Jewish prophecies, but we knew that they they knew about him. And when you see it for what it is, you start to see that the Jewish people, they had all the priests and the teachers of the law. They had the scrolls. They had the prophetic statements. And yet in the midst of it all, they missed completely the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. And that's because they weren't looking for God. They weren't looking for the Messiah. And that's because they weren't a faithful people. But even in this story, we see the Magi and the Magi They were a faithful people. They were looking for God. Now, we don't know anything about their faith beyond that. But what we do know and what we can learn from this story is that a faithful people are looking for God. And we don't want to be like Herod. We want to be more like the Magi in the sense where we're looking for God, where we make Jesus our number one thing. And Herod's response to the news that King, the king of Israel was born, shook him. It disturbed him. And we see how much it disturbed him here in verse 7. Let's take a look. It says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped 
over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Note to self, when Herod asks you to go and carefully search for the child and report back, ignore Herod and go and seek for God's help because he had a bad plan. To understand the level of discomfort Herod had, you really had to know a lot more about Herod. Now, I take trips to Israel every year as part of my ongoing education. I've been going now for five years. I've spent a lot of time in Israel. And every time I go, I take a group of people on pilgrimage to really help them understand who Jesus is and what, how the Bible unfolds. Really, it goes from the pages of black and white and red letters to just a real colorful interpretation. You get to see the land for what it is. And, and all of this understanding um, is important. And so in our pilgrimage time, we take a couple of days to really unpack the world of Herod because to understand who Jesus is, you have to understand who Herod was and what Herod was all about. And so the easiest way to communicate all of this is that Herod was an egomaniac and he, he killed his wives and children and for fear that they wanted to take his throne. And that's the guy in this story who says he's showing concern for Jesus. And again, we take the person in the story and we contrast Herod and Herod pursuing his own agenda. And, and he, he did a lot, just, just to be clear, Herod did a lot of great things for the nation of Israel constructed the temple. Amazing. He had aqueducts that are amazing. He had Masada. He had Herodian. I mean, these are amazing things that Herod had. However, Herod wasn't there to worship God. Herod was there to worship himself. And so you contrast that with the Magi. And the Magi were seeking the, the child of prophecy, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so they didn't know what it was about. I, we don't know what they do after they, they worship Jesus in this moment. But what we do know is that they were looking for God. And, and we also know that people of faith here, they don't, they don't just look for God, but they also worship joyfully. And that's a key thing we see in this text. Matthew does not give us great detail on how the star appears or how the star moves. Rather, he's helping us understand a couple of things. And that is, one, there is a divine intervening force in the leading of the Magi to the child. So Matthew wants us to catch that. There's a star, the star is appearing and, and then leading. Okay, there's one. The second thing is the Magi worshiped in humility and with joy, or better stated, they were overjoyed um, by the star and then they humbled themselves in meeting Jesus and they worship. So they had three different gifts and this is where the tradition of three wise men come because there's an assumption that each wise man had a gift but that's not what the text says. The text just says there was magi, plural, and that three gifts were presented. Those gifts are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So when we think about Christmas in our American tradition, we have to remember that many of Americans today have a Christmas tree, as you can see in the back of behind me here, um, and they have at least some money to spend and, um, and people to choose to celebrate in a variety of ways. I know that there are several people in several different ways celebrating Christmas. I know that not everybody has the same amount of stuff. But in America, we typically have enough to do maybe even a little something, even if it's just a gift card or something, which means we have a lot to be thankful for. Even the poorest of us have something to be thankful for. Um, and if we have a lot to be thankful for, I want to encourage you today to consider how you can worship Jesus. It's For those of us who have more than a little, it's critical that we seek humility and we seek to understand what does it mean to find joy in worshiping Jesus by giving and being generous to Jesus, by bowing down symbolically in our heart, spiritually lowering ourselves, humbling ourselves and considering. I just, when I think about the Magi, I think they're thinking about how do they bless the Savior? And so for us, how do we bless the Savior becomes the question. And you don't have to give gold and frankincense and myrrh, but, but maybe you can give something to the Lord that would bless him. And that would be a great thought for us today, blessing God. In our celebrating Jesus' birth, let us say and do and think and live in ways that seek to bless God, because that's what we see in this story. And finally, in Matthew 2, verse 12, it says, And having been warned, 
in a dream not to go back to Herod. They return to their country by another route. This is an amazing verse. So they go and see the baby and then by a dream they're led away. And you may have read it as part of the Christmas story somewhere or maybe you've heard it before. But what I'd like you to focus on is how much faith would it take for you to get a dream after you've worshipped the Savior of promise and then trust that dream to leave. And and the point that I, I find here is that people of faith, they cultivate a unique relationship with God. So as you're opening your Christmas presents, as you're celebrating the day, think about how can you celebrate in a way God, not just today, but every day, and cultivate this unique, faithful relationship with God. Because when we can do that, then we get to experience God in a, in a very unique way, similar to the Magi. These people, they worshiped God in such a way, they honored God in such a way, they sought to, to celebrate with joy, to humble themselves, to seek God out, right? The whole message, everything. And it creates this unique relationship with God where God is speaking to them even in their dreams. The Magi had made their decision to pursue Christ, to find the Messiah of prophecy, to worship Him, and, and, and God is leading them now. So it's an incredible observation that the wise men were Gentiles, and it's something to remember here. They weren't part of the Jewish nation or culture, and yet they are first among the worshipers, right? They're, they're, the shepherds are there, the, the, the family is there, and, and then you have the Magi that come to worship. So I don't know what your relationship with God is. I don't know what it's like, but I do know that if you want, you can have an incredible relationship with God. And that's one of the things I love about this story. The Magi didn't even know about God, and yet their desire to know the Savior of the world led them into a situation where they were able to really get to know who God was. People of faith, they cultivate this unique relationship with God. And this Christmas, my hope is that you would go on the journey of cultivating that kind of relationship, of walking with God, just like the wise men. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have an amazing Christmas. Uh, If you have a prayer request, go to orchardcc.org and then click on our live button. That'll take you to all of our prayer requests. But listen, go for a walk. Make sure you eat a bunch of food. Have a great time. But get out there. uh, Celebrate Jesus and have a great day. God bless you.